We spend a lot of time indoors and behind screens, living in virtual worlds on Twitter, Netflix, and in video games. But today, we're gonna encourage you to get outside. In this episode, you'll meet artists who find their inspiration in the great outdoors, and hopefully, they'll push you to do the same. Working outside, working with my hands, it's just good. It's just like, uh, not only good for me, but good for the community. We love being out in the country and enjoying nature and the peacefulness of it. We feel we're running out of time with the environment, right? Like the clock is ticking. So she's really a great symbol for the environment. I'm Amanda Paris, and this is CBC Arts Exhibitionists. <laughs> Twenty-four years ago, a guy named Tony built a snow fort for his kids. The next year, the fort got a little bigger, and the year after that, even bigger. Today, Tony and his team of artisans have basically built a snow version of Winterfell. Tony now goes by the name The Snow King. Armed with axes and adorned with ice-covered beards, he and his team are making North of the Wall look way more fun than I ever thought possible. <laughs> Hello, I'm Snow King. I'm king of that snow castle over there. It's uh, March, and we're uh, right on the shore of Great Slave Lake. This is Yellowknife Bay. This year, we're celebrating our 24th castle. It's come a long way since we started. The first uh, two or three, they were more like giant snow forts for my kids. After a while, it became three guys that helped me, and then by the time we got to the, about the ninth year, we started, instead of just cutting blocks of snow out of a snow bank, we started pouring snow like concrete, using a snow blower and throwing it up into a form and packing it down that way. And that goes a lot faster than building with the brick. We're getting the cold isn't that bad. Yeah, sure, some days are colder than others. As long as you're dressed properly and you're moving around, we're doing physical work, so uh, that keeps us warm, keeps the blood going. Yeah, as long as your socks are clean and dressed properly, that's good. I would say art is an important part of the castle because it's a way for all of the individual artists, the collaborative, for them to express themselves. For example, the outside of the castle this year is completely surrounded. Every wall all the way around has a carving, and it's the same theme, it's a wave theme, and that was one girl. And that was her third year working at the castle. She goes by the snow name of Vincent Van Snow. My snow name is Vincent Van Snow. I showed up on Snow's castle site three years ago, and they put a chisel in my hand and said, don't it up. <laughs> so far I haven't, so we're doing okay. I'm wearing two layers of thermal underwear. I think it's about minus 32, give or take. No wind today, which is nice. Working outside, working with my hands, it's just good. It's just like, uh, not only good for me, but good for the community. It's playful work. It's playful work, you get to create as you go. And How's that, is that straighter? The end of February and March, the sun starts to get brighter and everyone gets this ambition to get outside and, and then it becomes a, a real celebration of feeling free and getting out and, and everyone and their dog comes down to the, to the lake and checks out the castle and gets an excuse to get, get outside and play.
when it's all done, it's a venue for the other arts, you know, dance or music or, or even like an art show. When we first started, it was like uh, principally local artists. We were able to like get, you know, almost every band in town has played at least once in the castle. It's a, it's a powerful operation, you know, it's, it's good. It's, it's the best kind. Hi, my name is Arash Akari. Your exhibition is in residence uh, this week. Uh, I'm a visual artist and animator originally uh, from Iran and currently live in uh, Montreal. Uh, I mostly animate under camera uh, with different techniques like ink on glass, ink on paper, collage animation. And I'm mostly inspired by the human psyche and the relation between the self and the other in personal and social framework of life. Also the alienation of contemporary human in this framework. Take a look. Coming up, Professor Lees is here to tell you why you should get out of your house and check out an art installation. An installation is made of many elements that have a relationship to each other to make a larger point or build a larger story. Hey guys, have you ever taken your uncle to an art gallery and you're in a room where there's like 1700 daisies on the floor, there's a toy piano in the middle of the room and a huge model of a moon hanging over the whole thing and your uncle is like, what is this? I'm so mad. And he goes to the gallery cafe to eat a resentful bowl of soup and think about the good old days. I'm Professor Lees. I have 193 PhDs, 24 masters, and almost one BA. And for this edition of Art 101, we're talking about installation, that form of art that seems like it should be sculpture, but has way more parts and makes your uncle mad. A sculpture is fairly easy to define. Encyclopedia Britannica calls it an artistic form in which hard or plastic materials are worked into three-dimensional art objects. So, sculpture is a three-dimensional thing. Maybe it's a portrait bust or a unicorn or just a plain-looking box. But it's an object. It's tangible and it's in one piece. You can pick it up if it's not too heavy or you can take it away in a truck. Or you can just point at it and say, hey, that's a sculpture. The word installation is a bit different. Call it sculpture's complicated cousin. An installation might take up a whole room. It might have some video, a bunch of sculptures, maybe even some wind or some sound. An installation is made of many elements that have a relationship to each other to make a larger point or build a larger story. And rather than the specific objects being independently important, it's the relationship between all of them that creates meaning. Let's look at some examples. Remember that Yayoi Kusama exhibition where you lined up for 18 hours so your uncle could get a selfie in one of her infinity rooms? In those rooms, there were a multitude of elements that made the room amazing. Pumpkins, mirrors, twinkling lights. Each object or sculpture itself was just a thing, but the atmosphere they created together was magical and made a tiny closet feel like an immense landscape. Ai Weiwei is a Chinese political artist protesting the regime in which he grew up. He's a highly rebellious artist and installation art has been his most powerful medium. Take sunflower seeds, where he used 100 million porcelain replicas of sunflower seeds made by 1,600 people to comment on his feelings about mass production. The sheer scale of this installation, tiny seeds filling up a massive space, made a huge political statement. Some artists go even bigger in installation art. Christo and his partner Jean-Claude made their reputation by covering huge landmarks with draped pieces of cloth. They also called their work environmental art. They wrapped the Reichstag in Berlin, and after Jean-Claude passed away, Christo kept going, creating a three kilometer long runway floating on water in Italy that people could walk on. Again, you can't walk away with these installations. You kind of can't buy them but they create an immersive experience that's quite different from what a sculpture can do. Installations can cover big ideas. 
1979, American artist Judy Chicago created a piece called The Dinner Party that made a major case for feminism. It was a huge triangular table, and each place setting, from plates to cups to cutlery, was made in honor of an important woman, like Emily Dickinson or Virginia Woolf. Altogether, the table created the vision of a pretty badass feast and made the point that there have been a ton of powerful women through history, even if history has chosen to ignore them. <coughs> An installation can also just simply be emotionally overwhelming. This form of art is really effective at making you feel a sensation, be it physical, emotional, or intellectual. In 2008, artist Olafur Eliasson created an installation at London's Tate Modern and called it The Weather Project. It was dominated by a huge blazing artificial sun, and just using light and shadow, he created an immersive experience filled with hope and wonder and the moment before sunset that never ends. So why are installations important? Why not just stick to sculpture? If we break it down to its simplest, installations let artists do things that sculpture can't. Artists use installation to involve us more with the art. We get to stand in a space and have a different experience than looking at a single object, which in turn might make us think a little more or feel a little more. Installations let artists comment on the world in a complex way and make us part of the experience. They're also tricky to sell, so kudos to the artists for taking a risk. In conclusion, installations are really good at making uncles angry and forcing them to eat soup. But I hope you can use this little primer to convince your uncle to give that installation another go and keep your relationship going until your next gallery visit. I'll see you both here next time for more Art 101. Thanks, Professor Lees. What would it be like to wake up in a place where you're not bombarded with daily headlines about the Kardashians? I love digital life, but every now and then the constant notifications have me wondering, what would it be like if I lived completely off the grid? This next artist decided it was time to live the dream and her decision has completely shaped her artistic practice. Take a look. Hey, my name is Keitha Newman, and uh, I'm from Bancroft. We live in the backwoods, about 20 minutes outside of town. I am a visual artist, so I'm mostly a painter, but I do a lot of drawing and some printmaking as well. I first started painting, or thought about becoming a painter, when I was 19 and I was visiting my mom's cousin and she is a painter, a watercolor painter. And she gave me some lessons and I just fell in love with painting. It made me feel so good. My father had died recently, so for the first time in a long time, I felt really great. It was like a high. So I just kind of thought, wow, wouldn't it be awesome to be a painter and just be able to do this all the time? For living off the grid, we had to basically um, take what we got when we moved up here. So the, the cabin was just kind of sitting there. It had no running water. There was no hydro. This is a, a very large property. It's 200 acres. It needs a lot of attention. So at that time, it was getting a little bit run down and the fields were growing up. We came up here and got to work. At the time we moved up, um, I knew there was a little art gallery in Bancroft, but I wasn't really aware of much going on as far as the art scene went. I was approached by the art gallery. They kind of provided my first introduction to the people of the area by putting on a show for me. It's good to have somewhere in town where I can tell people that my art is showing. Living up here, we're just completely immersed in nature. When I go on my walks every day, the plants change from, from week to week. The creatures change from week to week. Like right now, I'm, I'm looking at lots of monarch butterflies and caterpillars I'm, and the, the milkweed flowers. And they're, the milkweeds are turning into pods. The caterpillars are turning into chrysalises. So I'm, I'm trying to capture, um, you know, that change in the season in my art. It covers all times of the year, and um, it's kind of a limitless source of inspiration. 
the reason we're staying off grid is we love the independence of it. We love being out in the country and enjoying nature and the peacefulness of it. When I compare it to how I felt in the city, I'd say that I just feel much more alive out here. I feel that I'm really connected to my environment and that I have to take actions every day to, um, to live in this environment. I intend to be buried on this property. Or at least my ashes anyway. So it's kind of interesting to know exactly where I want to be for the rest of my life. I don't know how many people have that, so I feel blessed. Yeah. Coming up, forget recycled clothing. The next wave in fashion is all about being plant-based. My idea was to try and find my own voice in the environmental movement. Whether it's Mad Max or the Book of Eli, Hollywood has told us that once humanity destroys the Earth, our sense of style will go with it. We'll be destined to dusty clothing that only comes in tan and brown with hard metal accessories. But Nicole Dextrous is an environmental artist who thankfully has a colorful vision for post-apocalyptic couture. And her inspiration comes directly from the idea of plant-based fashion. Take a look. Environmental art is really important because it's one of the most important issues that we are facing today. The usual narrative is usually very black and white, and art helps create sort of a color spectrum, showing us a different point of view, showing us that of course we're resourceful, of course if we put our minds to it, we can make change. I'm Nicole Dextrous and I'm an environmental artist. I'm often working with natural materials and I'm interested in making works that are ephemeral that don't really last. My idea was to try and find my own voice in the environmental movement. Using the garment in my art uh, in a very unique way, like making it out of flowers and leaves, which at that point nobody had done before, I felt like I had found my own voice. I'm currently working on a series called Addressing the Future, and what I do in that is I create characters that are in a dystopian future, and they're wearing plant-based materials, and of course they're surviving. The first one in the trilogy that I did is Persephone, and she comes from the Greek myth. Persephone in the myth eats a pomegranate which keeps her in the underworld. And uh, so I decided to use the pomegranate literally in her clothing. So I used the peel of the pomegranate to make her whole jacket. And it's put together with thorns. She's banished from the earth. And at that time, the earth is fallow. So she's really a great symbol for the environment and what we're doing to the environment. My second character is called Kronos. He's wearing a garment that is made out of yucca. His landscape is a desert. He's very engaged with this idea of time, which also relates to the environment because one of the things that we feel is that we feel we're running out of time with the environment, right? Like the clock is ticking. The hourglass is going to be one of the major props in the Kronos film. So I got one just as a inspiration for now while I'm drawing him and thinking about his character development. The whole project isn't just a film. It's actually, you know, from an artist's point of view, it's installation in galleries, it's uh, public performances, it's photography. 
I'm actually interested in incorporating all different kinds of levels and different mediums into one genre. This is, this is a durian, yeah. so a, a lot of experimentation with the characters. The characters that I'm creating and the scenarios that I'm putting in, they're almost like an antidote to the fear factor that we see in Hollywood films where everything is dark and we're all going to be zombies. I don't think that's really our true nature. Our true nature is um, one that is very generous and, and in a way very hopeful. It goes about today. We see this time and time again. Every time there's a disaster, people come to each other's aid. People help each other. That is our, our bright side. It doesn't mean that we don't have the dark side, but the bright side is what's going to see us through. So for the past 30 minutes, you've met artists who have built castles with snow, paintings from nature, and skirts out of potted plants. They're doing different things, but hopefully they've all transmitted the same message. Get outside. If you know any artists that inspire you to power down your screens, send me a postcard. No, for real, send me a postcard. Here's the address. Tune in next week for another deep dive into the transformative world of Canadian art. Peace.